This talk will be about the riemann roch theorem in algebraic geometry for curves of genus one. So the riemann roch formula states that L of D is equal to the degree of D plus one minus G plus L of K minus D. Where as usual, D is a divisor, which is a form of sum points n i p i, the degree of d is just the sum of the n i, k is the canonical divisor, and g is a number called the genus, which we're taking to be one, and since it's one, it cancels out with this term one here, so we can just cross out these two terms, and we get this term here. Now, as usual, you can work out l of the canonical divisor, which is g, which is equal to one, and the degree of the canonical divisor is two g minus two, which is equal to zero. And as usual, L of d is equal to zero if the degree of d is less than zero. Um, now we can work out L of d if the degree of d is greater than zero because this is equal to the degree of d plus l of k minus d. And this term here can be crossed out because the degree of k minus d is now less than zero. Uh, so there should be a d in there. So this is more or less the riemann rock theorem for genus greater than one. So we've done it for degree less than zero and degree greater than zero. Um, what happens for degree equal to zero? Well, L of D is equal to zero or one if the degree of D is equal to zero. And we, we now have a new phenomenon. So, so for genus zero, the dimension of L of D was always determined by the degree. And for genus one, it usually is, but it isn't in the case of uh, degree zero. Um, if L of D is equal to one for degree zero, this is equivalent to saying that D is principal. It's the set of zeros and poles of some divisor. Um, because if L of D is equal to one, this means there is some function whose poles and zeros are D, which is just the same as saying D is principal. Um, so this is just the same as saying that D is linearly equivalent to um, the divisor zero. So L of D is equal to zero for degree zero divisors corresponds to D being not linearly equivalent to zero. So um, obviously um, we would like to see some examples of that, which we'll see in a moment. Um, so what we're going to do is just work out everything. Um, we're just going to work out the riemann rock theorem explicitly um, in, um, using analysis. So we're going to take our curve to be the complex numbers modulo a lattice, where L is a lattice consisting of all things that form m omega 1 plus n omega 2 for m n integers. And functions on the elliptic curve are just periodic functions on C. So f of z plus omega 1 equals f of z. And f of z plus omega 2 is equal to f of z. Um, and from this, you can deduce several things about the divisor of such a function. First of all, um, the number of zeros is equal to the number of poles. And you can see that if you, if you take a fundamental region. So um, every point in the complex plane is conjugate to some point in this region under, under a, the, the group of translations in L. And we want to know how many zeros and poles there are in this region. Well, the number of zeros minus the number of poles is just equal to one over two pi i times the integral of the logarithmic derivative of f over c, where, where c is just, um, you integrate round the boundary of this region and 
if there happen to be zeros actually on the boundary, you need to fiddle things slightly, but I won't worry about that. Um, and now we notice this is equal to zero because the interval over this bit cancels out with the integral over this bit because f of z plus omega one equals f of z. And similarly, the integral over this bit here cancels out with the integral over that bit. So we just get zero. So this just says the number of zeros is equal to the number of poles. Or in other words, the degree of f is always equal to zero. So this is a first condition f has to, first condition a divisor has to satisfy to be the set of zeros and poles of a function. Um, so the um, next condition we can have is a slightly more complicated one. What we can do is we can integrate one over two pi i times the integral of z, f prime of z over f of z dz. And this is just equal to sum of n i p i, where p i are the zeros of f of order n i. Um, and that follows because f prime over f just has a pole of residue one at each zero of f and the pole of residue ni at a zero of order ni. Um, so the question is, how can we work this out? Well, if we integrate it over um, a fundamental, the boundary of a fundamental region, then the integral over the left-hand side and the integral over the right-hand side don't cancel out because z is not periodic. So what happens? Well, if you take the integral over this bit minus the plus the integral over this bit, what we end up with is one over two pi i times omega one times the integral from zero to omega two of f prime z over f c d z. So so the difference between z on here and z on here is just omega one, which is where that's coming from. Um, so what's this bit equal to? Well, this is just equal, well, the integral of f prime of z over f of z is just log of f of z. So we get log of f of omega two minus log of f of zero. And f is periodic, so you might think these two are the same, but they're not quite because the logarithm function is multivalued and only defined up to multiples of two pi i. So this bit here is equal to two pi i n for some n in z. So the integral over the pink bits becomes n omega one for some integer n. And obviously the integral over the two green bits becomes m omega two for some um, integer n. So we see that this, um, element here must be in the lattice L. And um, by the way, the, the, the notation is a little bit confusing since sum of ni pi can either mean the divisor, which is a formal linear combination of the pi's, or it can mean the complex number where you treat pi as a complex number and just multiply it by ni and add them up. And here we, of course, treating it as a complex number. So um, we have two conditions for a function, for a divisor to be the divisor of a function. Um, so if sum of n i p i is the divisor of a function, we know that sum of n i is naught, sum of n i p i is in L. Um, so um, using this, we can now um, investigate the riemann rock theorem. So first of all, let's work out what, what is L of P for P a point. Um, well, this is equal to one. Um, it's obviously at least one because we have all the constant functions. Um, and we want to know, can it, it's obviously either one or two. Um, and it's two if there is a function with a pole at p and nowhere else. We can ask, is there a function 
f with a pole of order one at p and no other poles? And the answer is no. Um, well, suppose f is a pole at p. Now, we know that the sum of the ni must be naught, so f has zero at some point q not equal to p. Well, then the sum of ni pi for f is just equal to p minus q, or I guess minus p plus q, which is not an element of the lattice L. So f cannot exist. Um, um, so um, we, we can now show that if the degree of d is greater than zero, then L of d is less than or equal to the degree of d. So um, we, we know that in any case, L of d plus p is always less than or equal to one plus L of d. So it's enough to check for degree of d equals one. And if the degree of d is equal to one, then it's easier to check. So we're trying to show L of D is equal to one, or less than or equal to one. If the degree of D is equal to one, we can put D equals P plus E, where E, the degree of E is equal to zero. And if L of E equals naught, then L of D is less than or equal to one plus L of E equals one, so we're okay. On the other hand, if L of E is equal to one, which is the other possibility, then E, the divisor E is equivalent to zero. That means L of D equals L of P plus E equals L of P, because if a divisor is equivalent to zero, then adding it to some divisor doesn't change the dimension of the space of functions. And we've just seen this is equal to one. So in any case, we've shown that if the degree of D is equal to one, then L of D is, um, is, 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 is also equal to one. And now, in order to prove the Riemann-Roch theorem, we now have to show the following problem. We want to show that L of D is at least the degree of D, or the degree of D is greater than zero. And um, so we, we've already shown that the left-hand side of this is at most equal to the right-hand side. And that was fairly straightforward. Showing it's at least equal to the right-hand side is somehow fundamentally harder because we've actually got to construct functions. I mean, we've got to construct enough functions with divisor at most d to show that um, this is at least something. So somehow proving that functions exist is harder than showing they don't exist because we actually have to find them. And to do this, we can use the Weierstrass p function. So, so we just recall that we define a Weierstrass function, p of z, to be sum of lambda in L of one over z minus lambda squared. Except if you check carefully, this doesn't converge. So that doesn't quite work. And we have to kind of twiddle with it a little bit. So it's actually one over z squared. So that's the term for lambda zero. And we sum over all the terms for lambda in L, lambda not equal to zero of one over z minus lambda squared. And then we add a constant to this to make everything converge. So this is just a sort of renormalization constant to get rid of an infinite constant we get in this definition. And then um, the p function is periodic. So um, here for lambda in L. Um, and it's got a pole of order two at all points of L, which is pretty obvious. You can just see these poles here. 
And now we, instead of having a pole of order two at the lattice points, we want to have a, a zero of order one because this is much easier to deal with. So we can get that by integrating this twice and then exponentiating them. So we define the zeta function, the Weierstrass zeta function, nothing to do with the Riemann zeta function, to be um, minus the integral of p of z. And then you can see that zeta has a pole of order one and residue one at z equals zero. And this is periodic, um, but zeta isn't quite periodic because there's a constant of integration that comes in. So we find zeta of z plus omega i is going to be zeta of z plus some constant, which is often denoted by eta of i. So now we want to get from this pole of order one and residue one to a zero of order one. So we define the sigma function, which is informally e to the integral of zeta of z dz. Or in other words, d by dz of log of sigma of z is equal to zeta of z. Um, and since we have to exponentiate, um, well, the, 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 the integral involves a logarithm term, which is only defined up to multiples of 2 pi i. But since, since we exponentiate, we get rid of these indeterminacies, and sigma is actually a single-valued function. So sigma has 0 of order 1 at all points of L. However, it's not periodic. Um, we see, as before, we get constants of integration. We find zeta of z sigma of zeta plus omega j is equal to e minus e to the eta j times z plus omega j over 2, if you work everything out. Um, so, uh, gosh, times sigma of zeta, of course. Um, so what's really going on here is that sigma is a section of a line bundle. Um, now, back in the 19th century, when people invented these sigma functions, they didn't know what a line bundle was because line bundles hadn't been invented. But they were sort of working with line bundles, except um, not saying so explicitly. So whenever you see a sort of fudge factor in a periodicity like this, um, one way of thinking of it is that these functions are really sections of line bundles. Um, and now we can... Um, find functions with, with given zero. So suppose D is a divisor on our elliptic curve given by some of n i p i. Now, if it was on a genus zero curve, we could find the function of these zeros just by taking product of z minus p i to the n i, because this function here is a zero of order one at p i. Well, we can do the same thing on an elliptic curve by taking f c is equal to product of sigma of z minus pi to the ni. So this differs from this expression here in that we have this extra function sigma going on. Well, the problem is um, f might not be periodic. So we can ask, is f periodic? And we can see that f of zeta plus omega j is equal to f of z times this big product over j equals 1 and 2 and i of, um, sorry, not j equals 1 and 2, product over all i of f of z times product of minus x of eta um, j minus pi times Ni. So uh, we want to know when this factor is 1. Well, it's 1 if, first of all, the sum of the Ni is equal to 0. And secondly, the sum of Ni pi is 0. Um, and now you notice that these, we earlier found that these were the necessary conditions to have a function f with divisor d. And we've now seen that these are sufficient conditions. So these conditions are equivalent to saying there exists 
f with um, f equals sum of n i p i equals d. So we found necessary and sufficient conditions for a function to exist. And we can now use this to prove the riemann roch theorem. Um, so what we want to do, um, so first of all, for degree of d equals one, we want to show L of d equals one. And to do this, we can pick p to be sum of n i p i, and we're now thinking of this as being an element of c, not as a divisor. And then L of d minus p is equal to one because this has degree is zero. So um, there's a function f with, with this, um, is a function f with f equals d minus p because this has degree zero and also has the property that the sum of all points in it in c is zero. Um, and now we see that L of D is greater than or equal to L of D minus P is greater than or equal to one. And we already know that L of D is at most one for D having degree one. So degree D equals one implies L of D equals one. Um, now, now we do the case where the degree of D is greater than one. So suppose, the degree of d plus p is greater than one. And we want to show that L, so we want to show that L of d plus p is greater than L of d. This will show by induction on the degree that L of d plus p is equal to the degree of d plus p. Well, what we need to do is to find a function f with f plus d plus p greater than or equal to zero, but f plus d is not greater than or equal to zero. I can't say less than zero because this isn't a total order, because that will show that there are more functions with these poles than with these poles, which is what we want. Well, what we do is we can um, choose various QIs so that D plus P minus the sum of the QIs, we're going to choose a divisor like this. And here we're going to choose a QI so that QI is not equal to P. And if D is sum of N I P I, we want sum of n i p i plus p minus sum of the q i is equal to zero in C. And we want the number of q i is equal to the degree of d plus p. And then this divisor here has the property that it has degree zero and the sum of all the, all the points in it is zero in C. So we can find a function f um, whose divisor of zeros is equal to this. And now we see that f has a pole of maximal order at the point p. So um, f plus d is not greater than or equal to zero because um, this is equal to minus p plus something or other. So um, this shows that L of d is equal to the degree of d whenever the degree of d is greater than or equal to one. Now we can write this out explicitly. So here's the possible degree of d. It can go minus three, minus two, minus one, naught, one, two, three, and so on. And L of D, you know, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. And here it can be naught or 1. Because as we said, it's for genus 
zero, we, we actually get an ambiguity here, depending on whether D is linearly equivalent to zero or not. And L of K minus D is just L of minus D. So this is easy to work out. It goes uh, three, two, one, zero or one, zero, zero, zero. And it's zero here, if and only if it's zero here, because we notice that L of D equals L of minus D because you can just change a function F to one over F. This is if degree of D is equal to zero, of course. And um, if, we sub um, if we subtract these, we find L of D minus L of K minus D is now equal to minus three, minus two, minus one, naught, one, two, three. And now you notice that this thing here is a polynomial in degree of d. And polynomial is, of course, just the degree of d. But um, so, so uh, the L of d is a bit badly behaved because it's got a sort of kink in it at zero. And similarly, L of k minus d has a kink in it near zero. But if you take their difference, these kinks cancel out and we get a nice polynomial. Um, so one other thing you can do with this is we can check to see whether we get a unique factorization domain. So you remember genus zero um, meant that we got lots of unique factorization domains. If we look at the functions with poles at a single point, then that's polynomial ring. Uh, for genus one, we don't generally get unique factorization domains. So let's just pick a point P which is equal to zero in, that, in our curve, C over L. And let R be the ring of functions, meromorphic functions, with poles only at P equals zero. So you can think of this as being the coordinate ring of the affine curve. And what we're going to do is to check that R is not a unique factorization domain. So, um, in fact, we'll come up with an explicit example of a non-unique factorization. So let's just look at the following points. Look at the points 0, omega 1 over 2, omega 2 over 2, and omega 1 plus omega 2 over 2. And we're going to find a function with a 0 of order minus 3 at naught, in other words, a pole of order 3, and zeros of order 1 at these two points. And you can do this because... This has degree zero, and the sum of all these with multiplicities is in the lattice L. So let's call this function Y. And then I'm going to have three more functions, A, B, and C, with the following poles and zeros. I'm going to take pole of order two here, and zero of order two at one of these three points. And then we notice that Y squared is now a unit times A, B, C. And this gives two completely different factorizations of y squared. So these are non-unique factorizations. Well, you may wonder, maybe we can, um, may maybe y and a, b, c aren't irreducible. Well, they are irreducible. Um, for instance, you can't write a as a product of two simpler functions because then they would both have to have zeros of order one at omega one over two, and we can't have a zero of order one and no other zeros on an elliptic curve. So um, the factorization of this function just isn't unique. We can actually write out these functions explicitly in terms of the Weierstrass function. So y, for example, is just the derivative of the Weierstrass function and the function a is the Weierstrass function minus the Weierstrass function at omega one over two. And these are similar, except you take omega two over two and that point and so on. And um, so um, what's going on is that there is a group called the Jacobian given as follows. It's the degree zero divisors form a group. So these are the things sum of ni pi with sum of ni equals zero. And then you quotient it out by the principal divisors 
of the form F. And this is, you can think of this as being the obstruction to um, being things being a unique factorization domain. And it's also the obstruction to finding a function with a given um, principal divisor. So um, for genus zero, we saw that the Jacobian was just zero because every degree zero divisor corresponded to a function. Um, and this sort of meant that everything was a unique factorization domain. For g equals one, you can see we've more or less shown the divisor is actually the same as the elliptic curve. Um, and for g greater than one, j is more complicated. Um, and we'll be looking at an example um, when g is equal to two or three uh, a little bit later. Um, so next lecture, I'll be saying a little bit more about elliptic curves and show how to classify genus one curves using the Riemann-Roch theorem. <laughs>